Lawyers, has there ever been a time the opposing counsel accidentally proved your case for you? And what happened? My favorite is a story from Jerry Spence. For those who don't know, he's a famous trial attorney. A witness on the stand was claiming he had suffered injuries to his arm because of a city bus accident. Jerry asked him to demonstrate to the jury how far he can lift his arm after the accident. The witness makes a feeble effort of lifting his arm. Then Jerry asks the witness to demonstrate to the jury how far he could lift his arm before the accident. He lifts his arm much higher. The jury laughs and the case is over domestic violence case where the husband beat the wife senseless. Landlord tried to evict wife for breach of lease due to the beating. Landlord claimed wife violated lease terms by allowing police to be called to property and causing a disruption. My argument was that as a domestic violence victim, wife is covered under VAWA and the property is HUD subsidized. Also, MD law refers to domestic violence protections too. Landlord's counsel during his opening talked about how my client was beaten and the police were called and an ambulance, etc. I just stood there looking at him. When he finished, judge asked if I had anything to say. My response? No, your honor. I believe opposing counsel has said everything that needs to be said. Judge smiled and ruled in my client's favor. Landlord can't evict a domestic violence victim. My family did foster care for a few years, and we fell in love with the last girl we took in, now my younger sister. She was required to keep in regular touch with her emotionally and physically abusive birth mom, the intention being for them to eventually reunite. This woman was a horror. Every single time they interacted, she'd spend the duration painstakingly shredding my sister's self-confidence. My parents worked hard to establish a strong rapport and a supportive environment, and she blossomed under their care. She's one of the most resilient people people I know. When the state tried to return her to her mom, she didn't want to go, so my parents made a claim for guardianship. This seemed like it would be an uphill battle. Here we were, a family of randos trying to steal a kid from her rightful mom. We were really afraid that she would have to go back, and that her crappy family would systematically undo all the hard work she'd done rebuilding her self-esteem. Fortunately, her idiot mom decided to represent herself at the guardianship hearing. I wasn't in the room, but I heard the audio recording later on, and it's incredible how thoroughly this woman shot herself in the foot. Here are some highlights. She kept trying to testify while cross-examining people. Example, would it surprise you to learn that blah blah blah? The judge called her out for this like six separate times, and she just kept doing it. She would admit to various incidents of emotional abuse, but then try to argue that it was all justified because her daughter was being a B-word. She'd ask witnesses, for example, and wouldn't you be angry if your daughter did X? XYZ? Yes or no? My personal favorite and the best example of her proving our case? It is absolutely not true that I hit my daughter with a wooden spoon. I only tried and missed. I'll prove it. I can show you the mark it left on the doorframe. Needless to say, we won guardianship. My sister never has to see that awful woman again unless she damn well pleases. I worked as an intern for a lawyer. Construction laws in France are quite strict in regard to the neighboring of historical monuments. The city was denying a permit for heavy modification of the house of our clients. They were arguing that because you could see the house from the church's bell tower, modifications were impossible. As a support, they kindly linked us to a 360 picture from said bell tower. We, as kindly, pointed to them that our client's house was indeed not visible from the top of the church. Building permit was greenlit the following day. Not a lawyer, but I am a former insurance fraud investigator. We were at a hearing before the WCB. I had something like 18 hours of video spread over a two week period of a claimant doing roofing work. The problem for me was that the video didn't get a clear face shot. Normally, what we like to do was get in close, show the face for a positive identification, and then zoom out. Bonus if the claimant was wearing distinctive clothing that could easily be tied to him. Because of where this guy lived, all I could do was show someone who matched his description getting out of a truck registered to him every morning. He wore a hat, he had a beard, and he had neither at the hearing. So the company lawyer is prepping me and basically letting me know to be on point. Because the claimant's attorney is almost certainly going to challenge the fact that it is his client in the video. If the video got tossed, the case was lost. About two minutes into the hearing, claimant's attorney agrees to stipulate to the fact that it is his client in all of the video. All of it. Our attorney was shocked. That was pretty much the only leg he had to stand on. Claimant's attorney was in incredibly smug right after this like it was no big deal. Evidently, his strategy was to 
show that his client wasn't really a professional roofer since he was doing the roof the wrong way. He tried to get me to answer questions about roofing. I refused as it was beyond the scope of my work, and he just wouldn't let it go. After about an hour of back and forth over this, the judge finally said, Counselor, it doesn't matter if your client is doing the work well. What matters is that he has stated numerous times and under oath that he cannot work. Whether he's doing it for free, for cash, or for fun has no bearing on the fact that he's doing roofing work while collecting compensation benefits which he was awarded because he couldn't do roofing work. The guy lost and had to repay a bunch of benefits. After a few of those hearings, I began formulating a list of lawyers I would never hire and ones I would absolutely want on my side. I had to go to court over a financial mess up when I was a student. Took advice from the university legal support team who said I didn't need a solicitor, so I went in alone. The judge didn't like this and postponed it for another date so I could prove I'd had more counsel first. The other party's solicitor caught me outside the court and said, I didn't tell you this, but, and pointed out a huge error in the financial paperwork that made it very obviously come out in my favor. Went back to legal support, got confirmation that it was right, went to the second hearing alone, and and got the entire thing thrown out. The other solicitor winked at me as he left. Saved me about 9k. Nice chap. I had a misdemeanor possession case I was defending. Client was driving his mom's car. He gets pulled over for playing the stereo too loud. There are pills in the center console, in a prescription pill bottle. The bottle has his mom's name on it. Client gets arrested and charged with possession of a controlled substance without a prescription. Case is obviously bull and the dumbest DA I've ever met in my life won't dismiss. We go to trial. During closing arguments, the DA says, This case is a circumstantial evidence case. During my closing, I slept slap the jury instruction on the projector and say that if a case is based on circumstantial evidence and there is one factual scenario that points to guilt and one that points to innocence, the jury must find in favor of the defendant and acquit. My client was acquitted. This seems like a really nasty move from the cop that arrested this kid. None of this needed to ever happen. When I first started, my firm had me on a case where the client claimed he lost because of ineffective assistance of counsel, basically saying that the old lawyer didn't do his job. So we prepare an argument based on not asking the right questions, not communicating, etc. We think it's going to be a tough case, but not unwinnable. Then we get the response to our complaint where the old lawyer argues that he was only ineffective because he didn't have time to prepare for the case and only reviewed it the morning of the original trial. He had known about the case for months, by the way. The judge saw this, and during the trial, we had essentially asked, isn't this the definition of ineffective counsel? Not giving enough time to your client? The silence from his side of the court was amazing. Needless to say, the trial didn't last much longer than that. Thanks, opposing counsel. I guess you were ineffective for both of you. I once had a district attorney indicate to the court that if defense counsel had included this argument in his motions, it would possibly be a valid argument. I interrupted him with the page number and heading where it was located. I was an attorney for the estate of a husband defending against claims for money by the separate estate of a wife over proceeds from the sale of a business back in 1996. Both husband and wife died in 2010. Suit was filed in early 2011. Went to trial in 2014. Wife got around 10% of the business in 1996. Husband got the rest. He had built and operated it for 35 years prior to marriage and sold it seven years into the marriage. The whole case hinged on whether the valuation of the business in 1996 was reasonable or not. We say, you can't value a business 15 years later with all the documents gone and all the main people in the business dead or missing. They say they have enough info to show the 1996 valuation should have been higher. Opposing counsels get a big time expert to testify that the business sold a $45 million based on a valuation, but should have sold for $70 million and the husband hid $25 million in real estate in the transaction. We get that testimony and then realize the 1996 valuation valuation of the business was done by the same expert. This is absolutely the most perfect catch-22 I have ever seen. So now we ask, okay, so was your valuation wrong in 1996 or is it wrong now? Expert says his 1996 valuation was right based on the information he had in 1996, but his valuation now is more correct, which then bears the question, what kind of information do you have now that you didn't have in 1996? I don't know. 
I don't have my file from 1996. Nobody keeps documents that long. And despite this lack of records, his valuation is somehow more correct now. Judge basically said the expert was talking out of both sides of his butt and we won. When I first started practicing, I handled a custody case where my client, mom, had a problem with dad smoking around the kids. I asked him if he regularly smoked around the kids, to which he replied that he doesn't smoke tobacco, only weed in the house. Obviously, this raised eyebrows as it is illegal in my state. He then went into a long diatribe about how he only follows the law of the streets, he actually said this, and doesn't recognize the authority of the court he was currently in front of. Needless to say, mom got full custody. Custody, especially after dad was arrested for going to the court service officer's house late at night and trying to kick her door in. My public defender wife was trying a case where the defendant was accused of filling fraudulent prescriptions. Now, keep in mind that public defenders deal with a lot of shady characters who maintain their innocence with increasingly implausible stories as the evidence gets worse. So you can get a bit jaded after a while, but you don't have to believe your client's story to represent them vigorously. So the prosecution has grainy surveillance video of someone who looks like the defendant getting the prescription filled and the ID used to fill it, which belongs to the defendant. Def defendant maintains that someone stole his ID and is using it because they look similar, and never reported the ID as stolen. My wife is skeptical that the jury will go for that, but she's always willing to go to trial if that's what the client wants. So preps that defense and heads into trial. Prosecutor brings in the pharmacist who reported the prescription issue, goes through the usual routine of establishing who she is, where she works, was this ID used that day, etc. Finally, the prosecutor asks the pharmacist if the person who attempted to fill the prescription that day is in the courtroom. Um, no. Oops. My opposing counsel made some off-the-cuff remarks about how their client had to go to another remote office to get all the records they wanted to use against my client. That let me know the witness they were trying to use to introduce the records as evidence wasn't actually familiar with the records or the records keeping process. In the jurisdiction we were in, records were exemption to hearsay rule, but you needed someone familiar with the creation and maintenance of the records to get them admitted. I attacked the witness's qualifications to get the records admitted and ended up getting the records excluded. I then made a motion for a directed verdict on the grounds they couldn't prove the case without the records, and won. All because the opposing counsel complained that their witnesses had to go way out of their way to get the records for the court. I had a hearing where the opposing party offered an updated contract that my client supposedly signed, except it was a horrible copy and barely readable. Then he assured the judge that the new contract was exactly the same as the old contract, except for the party name at the top. The original contract was in his mom's name, the new one in his name, and the date of the contract itself. He made that assurance multiple times. After he exhausted himself saying how everything was the same, I pointed out to the judge that half the provisions were different and that my client had never signed that form. The judge asked if we were really accusing him of forging my client's signature, since that's a serious accusation. I held up the guy's prior conviction for contract fraud and said, I absolutely am your honor. We won. Hands down, no further argument needed. I was about five when this happened, but my parents explained it years later. There was a series of trees on the sidewalk in front of each house on the street. Although they were not part of our yard, the tree was owned by my parents and they were responsible for it. Some guy tripped over a branch and was seriously injured. He came after my parents for all of the money. The dude showed up with a mountain of evidence. Hospital bills, psychologist testimonials, a photo montage of his slow and painful recovery, etc. Apparently, his lawyer brandished this stuff like a bat before court. My parents' lawyer thought he had a good case, until the first day of court, when he walked over with a picture and asked, Is this your tree? My parents looked at the photo in disbelief. No, that's actually not our tree. The opposing counsel repeated the question. It went back and forth a few times until my parents' lawyer incredulously provided a picture of their tree, which was, even to the untrained eye, a completely different tree. At that point, the opposing counsel whirled around and started screaming at his client. You said it was their tree. Case summarily dismissed. My parents walked out in shock, came home and bought me ice cream. All's well that ends well. 
Plaintiff was claiming insurance money because he accidentally chopped off his fingers while cutting bamboo with a machete, and the insurance company, our client, refused to pay the insured amount. During the hearing, the plaintiff attorney began to demonstrate with a rolled up sheet of paper how his client was cutting the bamboo when the accident happened. No matter how he tried, he could not reproduce the position of the fingers with the alleged cut of the machete. The only possible match would be if the plaintiff had deliberately extended his fingers over a plane surface and hacked his own fingers. Based on this disastrous performance, the judge determined an expert opinion was needed and later dismissed the case due to deliberate self-mutilation. Parents were being sued by their landlord, and parents had a countersuit against him. Parents were moving across country and found this house to rent. They did a walkthrough and everything looks great. Landlord wants first, last, security, and 1500 because they had a dog and two cats. Fine. It was somewhere in the $8,000 to $9,000 range. No big deal for them. They're set to move in on a Monday, so my mom flies in on Saturday to do one final look over, sign the contract, and get the key. Perfect. They are now the tenants. Monday, they arrive, and the house is trashed. The landlord has moved a bunch of his stuff into the garage, shed, and one of the bedrooms. There's stool in the toilet, pee on the floor, garbage laying everywhere, used condoms. I can't really do this justice, but my mom took pictures and videos throughout the entire house. She calls the landlord and tells him they are not moving in with the house in this condition. He tells her to clean the house and he'll buy the first tank of oil for the house. It was empty. Tells her to do it or he's keeping all of the money for breach of contract. A lot of back and forth happens and ton of harassing texts and phone calls from him. Court day comes and everyone's ready to submit their evidence in front of the judge. Parents have photos, texts, the contract, videos. Landlord only has a contract. But his contract is different than my parents. He's included a section that states they permit him access to the house for his storage needs and that the tenant is responsible for all on-site cleanup and maintenance after accepting the key. The best part was that the date of the signatures on his contract was the date they moved in, not the date my mom flew in and signed. Judge tells the landlord he's a special level of stupid, and then the judge's final remarks were about how disrespectful the landlord was to show up in shorts, a Hawaiian shirt, and flip-flops in his courtroom. He never paid a dime, then claimed bankruptcy, and started a business under a different name. Two years later, I went to his house, let out all but 19 PSI from all of his tires, and super glued the caps on the valve stems. I do only civil litigation. You would think it would generally be a battle against equals, professionals versus professionals. It's not. I face a fair amount of parties representing themselves pro se, often otherwise smart people who wouldn't think to do their own plumbing or operate on their own appendix, but have no qualms about appearing in court on their own behalf. Surprisingly, they don't know what they're doing. One of my favorites from a deposition, we didn't pay company X's invoices because we heard they were going through bankruptcy. A, they weren't and B, it wouldn't be a valid defense to non-payments if they had been. It happens more often than you would think. One attorney that people continue to hire, Brian, is sort of a legend. As opposing counsel four times in six years, he's lost cases against my firm where he could have won. This is civil litigation, but the guy has a knack for spoiling his momentum. One in particular, the evidence pointed that our client was at fault and we were asked to settle. Brian introduced a witness and voicemail to the record. We had no knowledge of these and asked to review. Upon review, we were confused as the voicemail had nothing to do with proving their case and made the plaintiff look like a lunatic. It was full of incoherent rambling and swearing. We allowed the exhibits to be entered and they went over as we expected and we won the counterclaim. A guy ended up taking my family to court basically because he'd been dating my mother and things ended. So he then takes us to small claims court with an itemized list of everything he'd ever bought the entire family. Every cheeseburger, every Kit Kat. He even billed for things he did, like house repairs. Some of the repairs were terrible and ruined other things. He tried to unclog the sink and ended up destroying the main drain pipe for the house. Now, he had bought some more expensive things as well. No one asked him to, but he was one of the types that loved to show how much money he had and would always talk about his connections and would name drop someone anytime we went anywhere. So when he takes us to court with his full itemized list, the judge asks him to go first to present his testimony. He basically says, while I was with them, I bought all this stuff. I took them to dinner all the time and all this, but it was the idea it would be paid back by them. Judge, you bought a child a birthday cake with the idea it would be paid back? Did you ever say that 
that these things were loans and not gifts? Him. Well, no, but I shouldn't need to. That's the normal way people think. Judge. Well, that's not the way I'd think. Case dismissed. I didn't prosecute this case, but I saw it. The state was prosecuting an individual for reckless conduct with a deadly weapon and criminal threatening with a deadly weapon. It was a bench trial because the defendant was a foreigner, and, I guess, the defendant was concerned that a jury would be biased against him. Essentially, the state alleged that the defendant waved a gun at two employees of a Dairy Queen and then discharged the gun in the air. The defendant was the manager of the Dairy Queen. So at the start of the case, the state requested a continuance because it could not produce the two employees. They had been subpoenaed but didn't show. The judge denied the continuance, so the state decided to go forward. It put on its case, but wasn't able to introduce any testimony that the defendant brandished the gun at the employees or that he had discharged it near them. There were admissions that he had had a gun that night, which he had shown to other people and testimony that the gun had been discharged. State rests. Defense does not move to dismiss and calls the defendant to the stand. I was watching in the gallery with some public defenders because trials were uncommon in that county. We immediately begin whispering to each other about how he didn't make the motion to dismiss at halftime. The defendant testifies about how he wanted to scare the two employees as a joke. Then, on cross, he testifies how he brandished the gun and what angle he was holding it when he fired. Defense rests. The judge had the longest delivery of verdict that I have ever heard. He said something to the effect of, It's rare that you find a defendant that convicts himself by his own testimony. But that is what happened here. Without the testimony regarding the gun, and the discharge, there would be insufficient evidence to convict. He goes on and on. While the judge was delivering the verdict, the defendant was standing, obviously. He faints and slams his head on the defendant's table. He ultimately was taken out of the courtroom on a stretcher and transported to a local hospital. There was blood all over the floor. The defense attorney, who was in his mid-60s, looked like he needed medical attention too. This would have been an instant ineffective assistance of counsel, but he was immediately deported, which is the main reason he went to trial, because he was also a convicted felon, though not charged with felon in possession in this case. And INS was only waiting for the conviction to deport him, so he was sent back to his home country. This was the most messed up thing I've seen in court, and have seen some wild stuff. I felt bad for the attorney, but ultimately contacted lawyer's assistance about him because I saw him do other things that were almost as bad. As a prosecutor, I was worried about his clients, who were paying him for the most part as the court was no longer appointing cases to him and his ability to effectively represent them. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications. Put the playlist on in the background to finish listening to all the stories linked at the top of the description. And if you like Am I the Genius, give Am I the Jerk a shot, linked in the description as well. Either way, thanks a lot for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.